My name is Dave. We haven't met. I have the privilege of pastoring here and also of continuing our series this morning. Hasn't this been a great series? Um, last week, Pastor Jeremiah, I just got to sit and listen and I was thinking, man, I'm, I was just loving uh, the message and just uh, walking through the Gospel of John and all the conversations that Jesus is having to actually look at the actual conversations that Jesus had with people and in groups in order to teach them about what it looks like to follow him in this world. It has really been great. And this morning we come to one of the greatest stories in all of the Bible, which I know I say all the time about lots of stories, so you don't believe me anymore. But I'm telling you, this one's great. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 9. If you brought a Bible, great. You can grab one out of the pew rack. I'm going to put most of it on the screen today as well. You know, back in the 90s, um, which was really a great era to live in, in case you missed it, uh, we had these things for a while that were really popular called 3D magic eye images. You remember these? Remember these things? They, they, were, they were all over the place. People um, would hang them in their offices, in their homes, and, and what they were were these pattern-like pictures that you would stare at with the hopes that some other picture within the picture would emerge. And some people were really good at it. They, they could just like look at it and be like, oh, I see it. You remember these annoying people? I, I was not one of them. I, I could never get it. I'd have to like cross my fingers, my toes, my eyes, my, stick my tongue out in a certain way, and still I would just see absolutely nothing. Can you guys see this one? Anyone got it? It's hard on the screen, isn't it? Yeah. It's an IQ test, really. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but they had these everywhere. And the idea behind these was not just that you would see, but that you might see, right? Friends, the same thing is happening all throughout the Gospel of John. You can see Jesus, but can you see Jesus? You can hear his words, but do you understand their depth and their impact? You can see that he does really cool stuff, but can you see that he is the way and the truth and the life? And friends, as we go through, the answer for most people in the story is no. They don't see Jesus. Even his own disciples, time and time again, do not get him. They do not understand him. They struggle to truly see him. You see, this is a section of John's gospel today called the man born blind. But what we will discover is that he is far from the only blind person in this story. John chapter 9, we're covering the whole thing today. Buckle up. It is a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Here we go, verse 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Friends, as the curtains open on this act of John's gospel, we learn that Jesus is on the move. John says, as Jesus went along... As he just went along his way, and right away, we see the reality that life with Jesus, life in the light, happens as you go along. It happens in your every day. Friends, the spiritual life is not just a segment of your life. It wants to infiltrate your entire life. I'll say it this way. Wherever you go, Wherever you are, wherever you happen to be, God wants to meet you, use you, work in and through you there. Wherever you are, God wants to use you there. And on this day, Jesus went along and we learn that as he goes, he sees a man born blind. But the question is, 
do the disciples see him as well? Because they're with Jesus in this moment. And, and the answer is no, they don't see him. Their response, who sinned, this man or his parents, tells us they don't see a human. They don't see a person created in the image of God who is suffering. They simply see a theological question to be answered. And their question did, did the parents sin while he was in utero, or did he commit a sin in the womb? How did this go, Jesus? Like, did he kick his mom too hard, or was he late for his due date? Or what did this kid do in there to deserve this? Because he was born blind. Whatever went down, it happened early, because he was born this way. This was a common belief in Jesus' day, that it was possible for a child to sin in the womb and if they did so, they might be born with some condition. It's kind of a strange way of thinking, isn't it? It seems weird to us. But friends, here's what's underneath this thinking. Here's what's underneath the disciples' question. Because their thinking is alive and well, I think, in our thinking. Here's what's underneath. Your suffering must be connected to your sin. If you're in a tough place in life, if you find yourself down and out, it must be because you, or maybe your parents, did something wrong. Your suffering must be connected to your sin. And friends, let me just say, this can be true. This is actually a biblical idea. Sometimes sin does cause suffering in our lives and in the lives of people we love. Many of you can testify to that experience personally. You've sinned and it's caused suffering in your life or someone you love has sinned and it has hurt you. But friends, far too often we connect suffering and sin too strongly. And here's why we do it it makes us feel better. It makes us feel better if we can think a suffering person, person deserves their suffering. You see, if they brought it on themselves, if they are to blame, then I don't have to care as much. Then I don't have to have as much compassion. I don't have to do anything to help. I can just walk on past with not as much guilt. Why? Because they deserve it. But Jesus knows the world is not this simple. And so instead of assigning blame, he focuses on offering healing. How about us? How about you? Do you spend more time blaming the world or offering healing to the world? Blaming people or offering healing to people, focusing on problems or with God, working on solutions. Life in the light sees suffering as an opportunity for God to offer healing. Are we becoming more like Jesus or do we really reflect his disciples in this story? Verse six, after saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Many of us have heard this story before, and so it is no longer weird. It has become normal. But stop and consider for a second how strange this is. Jesus makes spit mud and rubs it on this guy's face in front of an entire crowd. I mean, you can just imagine their response. Like, what is he up to? And the guy doesn't know what's going on. He can't see, right? Jesus, what are you doing? What's happening? How's this going to go, right? And here's the question that we should ask here. Why does he choose to heal him like this? Why does Jesus do it this way? I mean, why not just say the words? He, we've seen him do it before. He can just speak miracles into existence. Why not just lay his hand gently on the man's shoulder? That'd be a sanitary response, wouldn't it? Why not use his Harry Potter wand? And some of you are like, are you allowed to say Harry Potter? And yeah, I did. I did it. We'll talk about that later. Um, 
Why does Jesus choose to heal him like this? Here's why. He's taking us back to the beginning. He's taking us back to Genesis when God grabs some dust and breathes life in it to make mankind. And here, what does Jesus do? He reaches down, grabs some dust, and puts in it the life of his saliva to restore mankind, to give him back the light that we lost in the garden. You see, we must understand, and John is telling us right out of the gate, this story is not just about a blind man who can now see, but about how Jesus has come that we all might truly see, that the eyes of our souls might be opened. His neighbors, the blind man's neighbors, and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, didn't know how, and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Friends, you have to imagine the scene. This is such a fun scene. This guy rolls up into his neighborhood, happy and smiling and seeing, and people are like, dude, is that Brad? No, that ain't Brad. Brad's blind. Bro, I think that's Brad. Brad be seeing. Are you Brad? Yeah, I'm Brad. The guy's name was not Brad, by the way. Um, I just made that up. Church history says his name was uh, Celadonius, but we don't really know for sure. Here's the point. This guy has been so changed, so transformed by the light of Jesus that they don't even recognize him. Even with him right in front of their eyes, they can't see Check this out because John does this kind of thing throughout this story in such a fun way. He was the blind man, but now they're the ones in the dark. He's persuaded, they're undecided. He's assured, they're suspicious. He's convinced, they doubt. He was their neighbor. They saw him sitting there and begging every single day, but instead of believing that God has done a miraculous work, they would rather say, maybe he's got a doppelganger. You know what that is, right? A doppelganger, a person who looks like you. People say sometimes that I have a doppelganger, maybe. Um, You need to work on the timing of that a little bit. I had to wait for that. I was like, did that joke land? Okay, that's obviously a joke. Friends, here's the question for us. Are cynicism and skepticism robbing you of the life of faith and transformation Jesus longs for you? Are doubt and darkness and unbelief pushing back the light of Christ? Or, or like this man, do we know that we know that we know what Jesus has done in our lives? What is winning? Is cynicism winning? Or is faith winning? What's winning in your heart? They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Dun, dun, dun. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Friends, I don't don't know if you realize this or not, but the subject of Jesus is divisive. Jesus is 
polarizing. Jesus puts people on edge. You can talk and talk and talk about God in this world, but if you start talking about Jesus around the office, things get a little awkward. Amen? I mean, think about this moment. Think about it. Jesus goes to a man blind from birth, restores his sight, and people have issue with it. I mean, seriously, how could anyone, anyone with a heart, anyone with compassion, anyone with any kind of kindness at all be upset in this moment? But they are. This blind guy can see, and they are ticked. Why? Because Jesus broke their rules. Because Jesus is a threat. Because Jesus didn't follow their do's and their don'ts for the Sabbath. And so here's here's a question. Why does Jesus keep doing these things on the Sabbath? And this is not his first Sabbath infraction, 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 right? Infliction, infraction, one of those. Why does Jesus keep doing these things on the Sabbath? Why doesn't he just pick another day? Does he enjoy messing with the religious elite? Does he really want to take on the Pharisaic establishment? Is that why he's there? Or is there something bigger going on here? If you remember back to our Genesis series, the seventh day of creation, the Sabbath day, it was the only day that didn't have an end. Do you remember this? All the other days of creation, go back, read Genesis 1 this afternoon. In all the other days of creation, it says, and there was evening and there was morning. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day and the sixth day. They started and they stopped. But the seventh day, the seventh day was going to be an unending day when God rested when God would live in harmony, in shalom with us in creation forever. And friends, Jesus is showing us here that the whole reason the Sabbath exists is for rest, oration. You see what I did there? Sabbath, he's telling us, is not about religious rules, but about God's rest, about things being restored to the way God longs for them to be. But the Pharisees can't see it. The professional seers can't see. How ironic. They invoke the name of God, but they deny the work of God. They preach the truth of God, but miss the heart of God. As Dr. Johnson says, they miss the fact that the Lord of the Sabbath is at work and the best day to do works of mercy and grace and bring people into a more perfect rest is on the Sabbath. Now, before we go on, I want to tell you something. I'm a pastor. In case you didn't know, I'm a pastor. I'm a religious leader in the church. And as we read this story, it is not lost on me that I could be the most blind person in this room. That's very apparent in this story and all throughout the Gospels, actually. The religious leaders are the most blind of all. Religion does not always move us towards the light. Legalistic rule-keeping, in fact, will actually often prevent you from becoming like Jesus and making him known. So this passage is a challenge to all of us, particularly those of us who are the most religious. If you've been in church your whole life, listen up. The Pharisees choose rules over rest legalism over the light, and we must be careful not to become modern-day Pharisees. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. 
Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Spineless, anxious, gutless, yellow-bellied cowards. Their own son born since birth, has received his sight, and yet they are blind to the power of acknowledging Jesus. They're so afraid of what they will lose, their friends, their status, their position, their privileges, their reputation, and so they shrink back and they say as little as they possibly can. And and here's the hard question. How about us? Are we like these parents, blinded by social status and pressure, afraid that if we embrace Jesus too much or proclaim him too proudly, that our lifestyles and friendships will be impacted negatively? Friends, let me tell you, they will. Increasingly in this world we live in, they will. Just this week, our staff had a great discussion about having gospel conversations with people. And the woman who was doing some training with us reminded us, expect it, she said, expect to encounter people who receive you and reject you. If you follow Jesus in this world, some will celebrate you and others will despise you. Some will just be neutral. Some won't care. Some will be real open though. Some will want to hear more. And some will not only not want to talk, but may actually distance themselves from you and cut off relationship with you. But here's the question. Here's the question John is begging us to ask. Will you let fear rob you? of life in the light? Will you let fear rob you of walking with and following Jesus in this world? Will you choose social acceptance over gospel abundance? Not this guy. Not this man born blind. A second time. They summoned the man who had been blind. Friends, the Pharisees are back for round two. And remember, this is a guy who who's been ignored his whole life. And suddenly, people can't get enough of him. Jesus sees him. The disciples talk about him. His neighbors are interacting with him. The Pharisees call him in. They call him in a second time. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know I was blind, and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. This is what, he's starting to sound like Jesus now, isn't he? This is how Jesus responds to people. Why aren't you listening to me, right? I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want, do you want to become his disciples too? I love Bible trash talk. Like, Like, you got to really work for it to understand it. But this is Bible trash talk. Actually, this is like, this is like that scene from Goodwill Hunting. I'm just going out on a limb here for a second. The first service didn't catch this joke at all. But you guys, you're going to be with me. This is like that scene from Goodwill Hunting, right? Do you like apples? This guy's about to have a do you like apples moment. This is an unschooled blind beggar schooling the religious elite on who is and isn't from God. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Do you like apples? How you like them apples? He opened my eyes. Okay, 
You guys didn't get it either. Anyway, go watch Good Will Hunting. Robin Williams. You get it. Okay, so wasn't that funny? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. And not just out of the room, friends. Out of the synagogue. Out of the community. Everybody in that town was in the synagogue. He's no longer in. This guy is out. Let me, let me pause here and ask another big question. Why does this healing happen? Why does Jesus decide to heal this man's eyes? I, I, I ask because I think too often we believe that Jesus just feels bad for him and wants his life to be better. That Jesus wants him to be more comfortable. And, and yes, we already talked about it a bit. There is an element of God wanting to make the world right again, to restore the shalom of the Garden of Eden in our existence. That is true. But if you read this story, this man's life doesn't actually get easier with his healing. In many ways, it gets harder. His neighbors don't rally around him. His parents don't move towards him. The religious leaders outright interrogate and reject him. You see, the, the goal of this man's healing is not comfort and ease and societal bliss. The goal of this man's healing is for him to see Jesus. And friends, sometimes seeing Jesus is not all that easy. Seeing Jesus often comes with a cost in this world. Seeing Jesus means difficult discussions, risky faith, tough conversations, a call to sacrifice. If we back up this story to the very beginning, to the moment when, when Jesus like sm smears that spit mud on the guy's eyes and then tells him to go to the pool of Shalom, what does John say there? What is John careful to point out to us at the very beginning of this story? Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Shalom. And then here's what John says in brackets. This word means sent. Go, wash in the pool of Shalom. That means sent, everybody. What's John telling us? This is a story about being sent. Jesus heals him to send him, to send him to his neighbors, to send him to his parents, to send him to the leaders. Jesus heals him so that his story can be sent to the entire world. Friends, many of us in this room have experienced the light of Jesus coming into our lives. And John is reminding us today, he's challenging us today, that we have that light not just to stay, but to go, hide it under a bushel. No. That was a rhyme. <laughs> Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, that they'd tossed him out of the synagogue, that they'd thrown him out of the community. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I like it when Jesus is kind of like Yoda, right? Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Friends, as we finish out our story today, there are a few things that we must see. One is the obvious thing that Jesus is inviting this man to see with more than just his eyes. He comes to him, he finds him again to invite him to not just see with his eyes, but to see with his soul. He's inviting him to allow the light of God to shine in his entire life. Life, You see, his physical sight was given instantly, but spiritual, spiritually, his sight has grown methodically. Have you noticed this? 
Have you noticed this throughout the story? Have, have you seen this man's growth? Have you seen his progression? At the beginning of this story, his neighbors ask him, how then were your eyes opened? And what's he say? He says, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. That, that's, that's his first testimony. Who did, who did this to you? I don't know, the man they called Jesus. Then the Pharisees press him. They ask him, you know, who is this guy who did this to you? And he says, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. And, and then they ask him again. And he says, well, he opened my eyes. I was blind and now I see. He's got to be from God. And finally here in this last section, Jesus says, I am the son of man. I am the Messiah. I'm the savior. And the man says what? He says, Lord, I believe do you see how he's growing his understanding of Jesus? Do you see how the blind man who can now see is starting to truly see? He's starting to see how to live and who to follow. He's starting to see that the real light, the heavenly life is found when we follow Jesus as Lord. And friends, John has crafted this story oh so carefully to offer us the same choices as the characters in this story. We have a decision to make as well. Will we choose the light or will we walk in darkness? Every character in this story makes this choice and so must we. Will we believe in him or reject him? Surrender to him, follow him, trust him, or will we go our own way? Remember when Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world. You're like, oh, I didn't think Jesus was so judgmental. He's not talking about final judgment. What he's saying here, he's saying, you can't be neutral. Jeremiah talked about this last week. Jesus leaves no room here for middle ground. He's saying, do you want to see? Then come to me. If not, then go your own way and walk in darkness. Those are your choices. The light or the dark. There's no gray, there's no twilight, there's no middle. Which way will you go? And, and then he talks about how. How does this happen? How do you actually choose the light and walk in the light? For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Isn't that kind of a weird statement at the end? And then his last sentence, if you were blind, he says to the Pharisee, you would not be guilty of sin but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Here's what we must notice. The Pharisees think they know everything. They have all the answers. Read the story. Their theology, their theology is buttoned up and pinned down. They know what they know what they know. They think they can see, but in reality, they are blind. But the man born blind, do you see his posture? Did you notice his posture through the story? Do you know what he says over and over and over again? I don't know. That's his number one phrase. That's his number one statement. That's his number one testimony. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. How did he heal you? I don't know. Is he a sinner? I don't know. Who is this guy? I don't really know. I just know that I was blind and now I see. Do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? I don't know. Help me understand. Friends, this is a powerful statement, especially for religious people who always know everything. I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. You know who needs to hear us say that? People in the world. Hey, tell me about this such and such in the Bible and why there's these sacrifices and da 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 da. I don't know, but I was blind and now I see. My life was off track and now I'm walking in the light. Tell me about all these people. What about, what about the Crusades? What about scandals in the church? Right? What about this? What about that? What about all these questions that I have? And, and if you have answers to these things, great. It's not bad to have some answers, but you know what's also okay to say? I don't know. I don't know. But here's what I do know. 
I was blind. Jesus touched me. I'm changed. I was walking in darkness. But now because of him, there was light in my life. Friends, this is what Jesus says is the key to receiving the light of God. Knowing that you need the light of God. Not having all the answers yourself and receiving answers from him. Knowing that you don't have to, on your own, find the light. Actually, here's the answer. Knowing that you're desperate Desperate for the light of God, that there's no way on earth you can manufacture it for yourself, that you're as desperate as a first century blind beggar. That's what this story says. And and friends, before we get too excited about getting the light, as we close, I want to acknowledge something. That seeing, that having the light, that seeing is not always easy. In fact, in her Pulitzer Prize winning book, Pilgrim at Tinkered Creek, Annie Dillard recounts what she learned from blind patients who recovered their sight after having long-term cataracts. She talks about how in almost every case, the experience of sight being restored was initially exciting, but ultimately downright terrifying. She says it freaked these people out People would say things like, turn it off. I can't deal with it. This this light, this sight, it's too much for me to handle. Friends, the same can be true for Jesus followers. I, I mean, some of you out there are like, I'm a Christian. I have faith. I've stepped into the light. But I'm not as excited as this guy. In fact, I look at the world and I'm actually kind of Freaked out. I'm kind of discouraged. I look around and I wonder, why is this world so messed up? Now that the lights are on, I can see it. And it's perplexing to me. I wonder, why do I still struggle so much with sin and selfishness? I wonder, what is my life even for? And how in the world can I faithfully follow Jesus in this place? You see, this light in my life has raised questions in my life. Friends, if that's you, and if it's not, it will be at some point on this journey, what do you do? How do you respond to those questions? How do you respond to the reality of having the light in a dark and dreary world? Here's what you do. You do what the blind man did. You keep moving towards the light. You progress, you grow, You realize that with every encounter you have with Jesus, with each time you talk to him, at every turn where you trust him, he's rooting out the darkness in your soul. You see, the blind man reminds us a lot like Dory does in Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep progressing, just keep growing, just keep saying, I don't know a lot of stuff, which means I have a lot of stuff to learn, and my God is a great teacher. Because in the end, friends, here's the ultimate question for us today. Will we choose to receive and follow the light of Jesus like this blind man? Will we allow him to touch us and open our eyes? Will we respond by going and doing what he asks? Will we show courage when living for him is met with resistance? Will we walk with a humble posture of not knowing and have a willingness to learn? And through all of that, will we grow in our understanding of who Jesus is for the rest of our lives, that the light of life might live more in us? Friends, this is the offer of the gospel. This is good news. This is the heavenly light of life on offer to you and me today. Walk with Jesus. Learn from Jesus. You don't know it all. He does. You don't have the light, but he is the light, and he longs to give his light to you. He is the light of the world. You will no longer walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Let's pray. Father, this this morning, I'm going to pray right now for people in this room who have not encountered, who have not received the light of Jesus in their life. 
People who've been searching for that light on their own and have been trying to illuminate their hearts and minds and souls with meaning and purpose and satisfaction, God. And every time those flames flicker out, God, would you move in? By the power of your Holy Spirit, would you show them your goodness and your grace and your power and your mercy and that you are the way and the truth and the life? And then, God, I I pray for those of us in this room who have that light and who've walked with you, Lord, for a long time. Would you illuminate that again in us? Would you you save us from the temptation that we have to become religious, pharisaic legalists who know everything and who look down at the world and blame people instead of heal people. God, would you move us towards the heart that you long to have for us? Would you do that here in this church, that we would be a people who shine the light, the true light of your son out into this world? That's our prayer, God. We cannot do it alone. We need you. We trust you, and we rely on you for its strength. And we pray it all in Christ's name. God's people said, amen.